This show is brought to you by Schwab. With Schwab investing themes, it's easy to invest in ideas you believe in, like online music and videos, artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, and more. Schwab's research process uncovers emerging trends, then their technology curates relevant stocks into themes. Choose from over 40 themes. Buy all the stocks in a theme as is, or customize to better fit your investing goals. All in a few clicks. Schwab Investing Themes is not intended to be investment advice or a recommendation of any stock or investment strategy. Learn more at schwab.com slash thematic investing. And welcome to Money Talks, a special extra podcast from Slate Money, where we have conversations with brilliant and interesting people. I'm Emily Peck, co-host of Slate Money, and I'm here today with Chloe DeMond. Chloe is the writer and director of the Netflix erotic thriller slash finance drama Fair Play, which came out last year. She was a director on Billions and The Rock's TV series Ballers and has done so many more great things. Chloe, welcome to Money Talks. Thank you for having me. So on Slate Money, we usually cover business and finance news. We don't typically get into erotic thrillers or talk about any of (laughs) the more (laughs) uh, dramatic personal stuff that happens behind the scenes at work, typically, typically. But I wanted to talk to you because fair play gets into this dynamic that people don't talk about enough, this gender dynamic between men and women where women are successful, sometimes more successful than their partners but they feel kind of bad about it, ashamed. There's a whole dynamic where the man thinks he's supposed to be more successful and when the woman outshines him, well, we'll get into it. I mean, I should say that the movie is about a young couple working at a hedge fund. Their relationship basically starts to fall apart after the woman, Emily, played by Phoebe Dinever, gets a promotion. And the man, Luke, is played by Alden Ironreich, People may know him from Solo. He gets jealous and (laughs) awful things happen. So yeah, I mean, we don't typically see this kind of interplay in a movie and we don't talk about it a lot. Why did you want to show it on screen? For that exact reason. You know, I think that it's something that we deal with every day in different shades. I think it's something we deal with in the workplace. I think it's something we deal with behind bedroom, you know, doors. And I would say the reason why I wanted to make it was this is something that I've been experiencing for for so many years in many different relationships. You know, I'm someone who <laughs> has always been very ambitious. And I think even before I started to even get any little bit of success, my ambition just in and of itself felt like a threat very early on in uh, certain relationships. And sometimes I felt like I would have to kind of undermine my excitement over certain, you know, ambitions or, you know, when I started to get uh, certain career opportunities, I, I would undermine my excitement for those things um, in in front of my male partner who who wasn't, you know, doing as well at the time or was struggling or just didn't feel good about himself and in, in whatever that moment was. And, and it was something that I just normalized. And I think it's something that so many women normalize and just accept. And we don't talk about it and we don't acknowledge it because I think it's, it's, it's a scary thing to acknowledge, especially in a progressive. I mean, I look, I've, I've lived in progressive cities. I've dated progressive men. The idea that, you know, kind of, if I were to admit that this was something that was actually going on, then, you know, what would that say about me and my choice of partner? And what would that say about, you know, I mean, everything, it just, it just, it just feels like, I personally just wasn't able to to confront it, and and um, it was something that after many years, as my career started to to take off, and and I got more and more jobs, and I think as I was dealing <laughs> with more and more pra- passive aggressive comments, and it took me many years to realize that that all the tension in my relationship was stemming from that, and once I did realize it, you know, and I was more aware of it, it, it became very painful. But it, you know, those 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 tensions didn't go away, and I think they they just they just got worse. Um, you know, uh, the more my career um, accelerated, and and it just got to a point where where it became intolerable for me, and and I be I got pretty angry about it. I'm like, why is this something? 
why do I have to live my life like this? You know, and why is this something that we both kind of have to suffer through? And why is this something that we're afraid to talk about? And so that's why I wrote the movie. Wow. There's a scene in the movie, and you you talked about this in a video I was watching online earlier, but there's a scene that I think really encapsulates what you're saying in the dynamic. Because the dynamic isn't just that the guy feels uncomfortable because his partner's outshining him. You're saying like you also feel a discomfort. Like you know subconsciously that you're not supposed to be more successful than your partner. You don't really think that probably, but like you, you kind of like feel it in your gut. So you have that scene early on in the movie where the Emily character comes home. She's just gotten a promotion. It's like great news, but the scene is like, it's shot and, and it comes across like, like you're on the edge of your seat. Like you're so anxious. She has to tell her boyfriend she's gotten a promotion, which is like, again, good news. But the whole scene is like fraught with all this like anxiety. She can hardly look at him. Mm -hmm. He finally says to her, I'm so happy for you. But his eyes are like dead (laughs) when he says it. (laughs) I'm so happy for you. It's just so, it's so amazing. Yeah. So it's not like she feels like she doesn't deserve it, right? It's not like she has been working, you know, her her whole adult life like towards this moment, uh, towards getting this, this opportunity and this promotion. But there's, it's more like this feeling that she feels like he can't handle it. There is just this unspoken, ingrained kind of foundation of stuff and feelings that, that I think is just ingrained in so many of us. And just this idea that, yeah, I can a man handle a woman's success if he's not doing well himself or if he's not maybe one step ahead. And it's just this fear that her accelerating past him will cost her her relationship. And so her first reaction, I mean, she apologizes for her success. And it's because she she is afraid that her relationship will suffer in some way because, because of her success. And I think that that's a fear that so many women have experienced, you know, on very different levels. And then I, I would say on the one hand, you know, <laughs> Luke... I was really trying to show that in many ways he represents the modern man of a certain age, you know, a man who was super progressive, who who adores Emily because she's intelligent, who adores her because uh, because she's a killer, like because she's good at her job. Like that's why he's attracted to her at the same time because of the way he was raised, right? Under more traditional ideas of gender roles, you know, at a time where his parents, you know, his father was probably the breadwinner and his mother, you know, stayed at home. The, just of what what was ingrained in him, there's this feeling like he needed to get there first. And so it's like that struggle between those two things is what causes like his reaction to it, knowing that he is on one hand excited for her, but also shocked and almost paralyzed. Like he never really actually thought that she would pass him, that it was fine when they're on the same level and the relationship works either when they're on the same level or he's one step ahead. And obviously all the cracks start to show once, once the thing gets flipped. Right. I, it makes me think about this thing people say, which is, um, you're going to let a girl beat you. Uh, I just was in a situation where a family member said that to a younger member of my family. And I was just, that's it. You know, you're going to get a let a girl beat you is like the whole mechanism behind the whole phenomenon in a way. Like you can't let Luke can't let Emily beat him, you know, like you're not supposed to. That's the that's the rules of the playground. And I feel like we all know that deep down. But I wanted I wanted to talk more about Luke because later in the film, Luke kind of like goes a little incelly. Like he starts reading these books. And what were you trying to show with with that? Do you think? He cannot accept the idea that he didn't get the job because he's inferior. He he cannot he cannot accept that. He cannot face that. So he's starting to look for answers in all the wrong places to give him this idea of like that he is of value, but there, you know, something something outside of his control prevented him from having it. But the fact, you know, but this is a man who, who can't face his his own failures and his own weakness. And so he starts kind of going down the rabbit hole looking for reasons, other reasons of why he didn't get it. And, and other reasons that, that can help him kind of boost up his confidence again to get the thing that he wants. So I, I feel like, the, it, it, you know, it's at this point in the film where, where he's so insecure, he's so rattled by, by this thing that happens. And um, I just think that there are these Jordan Peterson type figures out there who kind of prey on these men dealing with, with the crisis of masculinity. 
he feels like this is this is a path that can help him kind of reclaim his masculinity and his sense of purpose and get him back on on the track towards something that he believes he deserves. This episode is brought to you by Splunk. You need to keep operations humming around the clock, but potential disruptions are everywhere. Splunk helps you predict problems and find and fix issues fast so you can reduce risk and ditch downtime. The world's largest enterprises rely on Splunk's unified security and observability platform to become more efficient, resilient, and innovative. With Splunk, you can react quickly, evolve faster, and be ready for anything. Stay ahead of disruptions. Learn more at splunk.com slash resilience. When it comes to your finances, go for the credit card that's always there for you. With 24-7 U.S.-based live customer service from Discover, everyone has the option to talk to a real person anytime, day or night. Yep, that means no more waiting for, quote, normal business hours just to get a hold of someone. We're talking real service from real people whenever you need it. Get the customer service you deserve with Discover. Limitations apply. See terms at discover.com slash credit card. So in the movie, I mean, neither Emily nor Luke, neither of them really come off that well. Like there is a, a scenario where you could have really played it as like Emily is the good one. And I'm not just saying that because my name's Emily, but it does roll off my tongue that Emily's the good one and Luke is, you know, the villain. But like later on in the movie, there's this one thing that Emily does that really makes it clear, I think. Well, makes it clear. She does this thing, which is kind of like, it's like kind of a a big lie. And it's the kind of thing that like men will accuse women of doing in the workplace, you know, making up, making up facts sometimes. So I was sort of curious why like complexify Emily in that way. What does it say about the whole dynamic? Do you think? Oh, I would say in general, I didn't set out to make a film where there's a stereotypical villain and a stereotypical victim, because I don't think that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and also, <laughs> I don't think that that's real life. I think that that we're we're all complex and we're all flawed. I mean, look, when I've been in toxic relationships, I have not been the best version of myself. You know, I think when when you're in that that kind of toxic environment, the ugliest version of yourself can come out too. That was one thing that I was that I was going for there, but but also, I mean, I, I would say in terms of the the lie that she that she tells Campbell, I mean, to me, like that's, I actually find that scene very tragic and very and uh, quite devastating because the scene right before that is her covering up her bruises from the assault, and instead, you would think that okay, the step after that would be to go to the police, you know, report what happened and whatever, but instead. It's like if she were to report what happened, she would have to admit that they were together, that then, you know, they were breaking company policy because it's against, you know, company policy and this fear that she would lose her job. So the reason why, you know, it's like she has to hide her sexual assault to save face with her boss and to save her job. And then she has to make up this lie because in her mind, it's the only way to save her job. And the thing is, at that point, Luke has already, I mean, he's already outed her in the most obscene way in the office that he's not coming back to that place. So really for me, that moment is uh, she has to go to this extreme place to, to protect her job. And, um, and I don't know, I personally find, find that scene quite devastating. Yeah, I guess it's sort of like the most extreme version of something people do all the time, which is like cover up their real lives at work in various ways. Yeah. I was, I was also going to ask you why, I mean, this dynamic happens in all kinds of workplaces. Why the, why finance? Why'd you pick a hedge fund? I think, you know, for a number of reasons, I would say, you know, my experience with these kinds of dynamics was, you know, my experience and kind of my rise in in the world of television. And, and I was as I was getting more and more kind of opportunities in in the commercial space and, and the television space and, and, and the relationships I had while while those things were happening. I think that there are a lot of uh, parallels to my experience in television to the finance world. Uh, And I have a lot of friends in the finance world. And it felt like, um, just for example, just the high stakes nature of that world, the amount of money that's on the table when you're shooting a scene. And if you don't make your day on a certain show, you cost the production hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and the pressure of that, you know, and the high stakes nature of that. And then, and then it's also that on one day, you know, I, if I'm directing a show, let's say the show is a seven day shoot. It's like on one day you make your day, you, you, you know, you shoot the scenes, everyone's super happy, you're a hero. And then on the next day, it's like something happens and you don't finish a scene and suddenly you cost, you know, production hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's how it can fluctuate so quickly to you being like kind of, you know, uh, on top of the world and, and, and kind of, and then feeling 
so low and, and at the bottom and how it can fluctuate so quickly in a matter of, you know, 24 hours or less, that to me um, is, is very similar to, to what it feels like to work in finance, you know, and then one day you can make the firm $20 million and the next day you can lose $30 million and, and what that does to your psyche and, and, and the emotional highs and lows, I think is something that I, I felt like I, I could personally tap into, um, and understand. I think that those highs, those high highs going from high highs and, and going from low lows, how toxic that, that can be and how the toxicity I would say of a work environment feeds into the toxicity of an already toxic relationship. And it becomes this vicious cycle that you can't really uh, escape. So I would say that that was really the main, the main intention and choice for, for setting it uh, in the finance world. It just felt like I could, I could understand, even though I knew nothing about finance going into this, I felt like I could, I could relate to, to what it is to be in that kind of work environment with those kinds of pressures and those kinds of uh, stakes. You're a director, on, or you were a director on Billions. Yeah. And Billions is so, they just, it's so glamorous. It makes the whole world, <laughs> that whole world is just so fancy and so glamorous. And, you know, it's that whole, like, I want to live in their world kind of a thing when you watch it. But the way you make the hedge fund world look in fair play, it's much more, it just feels grimier and dirtier. And they're often like, they leave their apartment when it's dark out. They come back to their apartment when it's dark out. They live in kind of like a crappy neighborhood. She wears these clothes that are like, they have Ann Taylor vibes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Is that something you thought about too? Like not glamorizing finance, making it more gritty? I think grounding it a little bit more, I would say in reality, you know, and, and also these are, I think, you know, my choice was, I was, I was centering the story around two um, analysts who were just, you know, they were kind of at the lowest level of that. Yeah. Just starting out. Yeah. Just starting out in that, you know, um, in that world, they're not throwing around their money in these, in these ridiculous kind of flashy ways. Cause they don't, they don't have that amount of money yet. They're, you know, two steps below, you know, getting, getting to that place. I also just thought that, you know, these were, they're also in their twenties, they're younger adults who would want to be, I would say, first of all, because their relationship is a secret, they would want to be as far away from their work as possible as to not to run into people. And I also think given the fact that they're in their twenties, it just setting them, you know, in Chinatown, Lower East Side just felt right. And it also, what what excited me about it is that it was a different texture to the all glass, you know, midtown finance, finance uh, environment. And then, and then, yeah, as you pointed out, they're like vampires, you know, they're vampires and they're workaholics. They work all day. They kind of work all night um, or sometimes they work all day, they drink all night and, um, and then they wake up and they do it all again the next day. But, um, but yeah, they have to be up at 4 a.m. to check in on the British, you know, the London Stock Exchange and and all the international stock exchanges, is it because that's going to form like their bets for that day. So because they're so consumed by their work almost 24 hours a day, um, that's part of why they are not equipped to take a step back or to take a breath and to kind of evaluate the situation. They're just in this go, 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 go mentality, which is which is part of what leads to such a you know explosive act. Yeah. It's really, it's crazy making to live that way. It's almost like, it's like being in the casino, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. never can yeah. go outside. Slate Money is sponsored this week by Thorn, which is for people who want to be in control of their health. And being in control of your health means being super mindful of what you put in your body. That means the food you eat. It means the supplements you take. That is where Thorn comes in. Thorn takes a personalized, innovative, and scientific approach to health and wellness, and they make supplements. They manufacture all of their supplements in the U.S. They have top-notch ingredients, and they have a whole suite of different supplements you can buy from them. B-complex, creatine, magnesium citrate, basic prenatal, whatever you want, they have it. I use their little green powder thing which you whip up with 12 ounces of water and it creates a very healthy and good for you green juice thorn is trusted by over 5 million customers including 100 plus professional sports teams multiple u.s national teams give your body what it really needs with thorn go to thorn.fit slash money and use code money for 10% off your first order. That's T-H-O-R-N-E dot F-I-T slash money. 
code MONEY for 10% off your first order. Thorn.fish slash money, code MONEY. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. You want control of your financial future, and Schwab knows that. That's why when it comes to managing your wealth, Schwab gives you more choices, like full-service wealth management and advice when you need it most. You can also invest on your own and trade on Think or Swim, the powerful, award-winning trading platforms. Plus, you'll get low costs, transparent pricing, and 24-7 live help. Because Schwab understands it's your financial journey, and they believe you should have choices in how you invest. Visit schwab.com to learn more. Apple Card is the perfect cash back rewards credit card. You earn up to 3% daily cash on every purchase every day. That's 3% on your favorite products at Apple, 2% on all other Apple Card with Apple Pay purchases, and 1% on anything you buy with your titanium Apple Card or virtual card number. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Terms apply. I wanted to kind of zoom out a little bit and ask you like the businessy stuff, I guess. Like, like how did you get this movie made? We were describing it, or I described it as an erotic thriller earlier. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's not like your typical erotic thriller where like the woman goes crazy in some way or poses a real danger to the man, like something like fatal attraction or something. In this one, it's the man really goes goes crazy. So, I mean, how did you get it made? Was there resistance to that kind of reversal? You know, I was really lucky that I met uh, my agent sent the script to just people she thought would get the movie. And um, I was really fortunate that that um, she sent it to to MRC and uh, T Street. They were the, the financing studio and the production company. And they read it pretty quickly and they just, and then we spoke and I, I, you know, I pitched my vision for the film and they were, they were basically looking for films like this for first time filmmakers with like a kind of strong, bold, and in many ways, (laughs) risky vision, you know, for something um, because they were starting their emerging filmmaker program. So they were looking to finance, you know, first time feature films that were 5 million and under. And they just, they really, they really love the script and they really understood it. I would say, you know, in terms of the genre, I've never coined the film an erotic thriller um, for me, but you know, there are definitely some influences that I've had. Like my favorite, one of my favorite movies is Eyes Wide Shut. And there's a lot of crossovers to the erotic thriller, I think with this film. But I think, you know, for me, my, my intention was always to make a thriller about power dynamics within a relationship. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and a thriller that explores male and female dynamics, you know, some of the crossovers, it, it, it happens to be highly sexual because I do think, you know, when you're talking about power dynamics between men and women, you can't take the sex out of that. You know, when you read the script, it would say on paper, it, it, the sound of the script is not like the com- most commercial, you know, viable script when, when the you know, film starts with a, a bloody oral sex scene and, and escalates to sexual <laughs> assaults. I was expecting a little bit more pushback on on that or, you know, people voicing their concerns about, you know, commercial viability because because this, you know, includes a sexual assault scene. But, you know, I think that for me, it's like it's all about execution. And when I pitch them um, my vision for it and, and this is this is something that I believe for for most of the films that I want to make, I believe like the tougher the subject matter, the more entertaining a film needs to be. Um, and I think that there's a big divide in Hollywood because you have these really, these kind of, you know, bigger films that are, that are only concerned with entertainment and they have no substance and meaning and they have nothing Mm -hmm. new to say. And then you have smaller films that are exploring really tough subject matters, but they tend to be a really tough watch. Um, and for me, I always said I wanted to take audiences on a ride and, and, and I wanted to keep them on the edge of their seat. And, and I feel like if you can... (sighs) That's the way to to pull in a larger audience is is by using the tools of entertainment, right, to get people or to get a larger audience to lean into something that they would normally be too scared to touch. So that's what I wanted to do with this film, because I thought, okay, there's a there's a version where you could make this story pretty bleak 
It could be a tough watch. It could be an uncomfortable watch. You know what I mean? And I wanted as many people to see this film as possible because I think this is something that is incredibly important that we have to start talking about. And I, and I, I made this film to start conversation and debate on, on these gender dynamics and these power dynamics. Um, so, so for me, it, it's exciting to figure out how can, how can I use the tools of entertainment in, a, in an exciting and nuanced and compelling way to get a large audience to lean into something that they would normally be turned off you know, by. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the bloody oral sex scene. I've been trying to like kind of think about what purpose the scene serves. So basically Luke and Emily have sex in a bathroom and he goes down on her and there's she's on her period and there's blood everywhere. And it's like, it's kind <laughs> of a fun, joyful scene. I don't think I've ever seen a scene, seen a scene like that in a movie before. And it was, it was like kind of, delightful to see. <laughs> and yeah. I thought one reason to do a scene like that is to show that Luke, the Luke character is like a progressive kind of guy because he's not grossed out. He's, you know, he's just like, they're just happy together. And then, yeah. And then to have the contrast at the end, there's another bloody scene, but it's not a happy scene. Yeah. So it sounds like there was no pushback on, on showing that I was, that's surprising. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because also all the producers on this, my phone were men the financing studio were all men <laughs> like, but uh, no, they, they found it fun and charming and they felt like that's the way that you will fall in love with these characters because it's charming, because it's messy, because it's human. You know, I didn't get any pushback on that. And I will say really, yeah, my intention for that scene was to, um, was to show, you know, as you mentioned, um, and talking about how progressive he is, but I really wanted to set up that, that on the one hand, you know, this is a character who is not threatened by women, you know, I mean, how, how could he be threatened by her if he has her blood on his face? <laughs> and I think that that was really important because I also, again, didn't want to show a stereotypical villain and that, you know, it's not one or the other. It's not like, okay, he's, he's someone who is just threatened by all women and that's it. No. I mean, this is a guy who fell in love with her, you know, for the very same things that he ends up later on being threatened by. That's was something that was interesting for me to explore, to show that it's not black and white, you know, that these things are messy and confusing and, and, and sometimes in opposition to each other. But I will say, you know, the other things that that opening scene was doing um, was foreshadowing, you know, uh, some of the violence to come, you know, at the end of the movie. But I would say that the main purpose was just getting you to fall in love with these characters. You have to fall in love with them in the first five minutes of the movie, because I would say, you know, after that, she gets the promotion pretty quickly and then turn pretty, their relationship gets flipped quite quickly after it's that. It's a great way to fall in love with characters that I don't think anyone's really thought of before. Do you think this movie could, would have been made? Could you have made this movie before Me Too? I think if it kind of, as a, and I heard someone else say this, it's not my brilliant idea, but like as a post Me Too movie, this would kind of mm -hmm. fit the bill. Mm -hmm. I think... You know, that that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think that it's something that, that again, like this is something that I've been experiencing and feeling for the last, I don't know, 12 years, you know, again, in different, different shades of it, different, you know, different circumstances. But uh, these are tensions that, that I've, that I've felt since, you know, my, my early, early twenties and then women that are much, you know, older than me, like this was their whole life. So it's like, in a way it, it's a film that, I think could have been made at any time. Would it have the impact that it, you know, or would people, you know, would it have felt too soon? Totally possible. You know, I do think for the, the reason why I wanted to set this in a post me Too world was, was to show that, okay, we've, we've progressed this far, but, but now what, you know, there, there's, there are still these, these tensions that we experience in our relationships and, and in the workplaces that, that again, we, you know, for me, we, we normalize. And it's part of normalizing this behavior that makes it so problematic. Have you figured it out, <laughs> Chloe? Um, you made this movie. <laughs> you, you're like cognizant yeah. of this dynamic now. Like, how do you deal with it? Now you're more successful than ever, I imagine. I know. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. So I did meet someone um, about six months ago, and it has totally broken the mold. And it has totally, yeah, broken <laughs> the cycle he's not American. He's from, he's from Italy. And I think that this is actually what's kind of interesting. There are two, there are two things here that I've been thinking about. First of all, he, this is a man who was raised by a woman who was the breadwinner of the family. So 
that's the house that he grew up under. And so I think that that definitely factors into to things that, <laughs> that make it more healthy and more acceptable. And the other thing is like, you know, there's this thing where I just feel like it's very American that our whole self-worth is based on achieving. Right. And I think, I do think that is a very American thing. And there's something about Europeans and especially Italians where their self-worth is not about achieving. It's about lots of other things. Like it's about cooking and how well can you cook, you know, this ragu and how well can you cook a carbonara? And like, you know, that, that's how he almost values his self-worth. And it's, you know, he doesn't see my success as a poor reflection of him himself in any way. That's what I've been reflecting on and, and thinking and, and feel like that's added to an actually healthy, finally, a healthy dynamic in my personal life. So I do have hope. I mean, look, for many years when I was experiencing this, I was undermining myself and I was undermining my success, you know, but this, this was, you know, at the time it was all subconscious. And again, it, it all just felt like a normalized, you know, thing to do. And after making this movie and, you know, after... Um, having all the experiences, you know, had I not met him and if I were going out in the dating scene, I were to, you know, feel those kinds of tensions again, I wouldn't, I would, there's no way that I would ever undermine myself. There's no way I would ever undermine my success. I would never, you know, if someone can't deal with it, then I'm out, you know, and that's the bottom line. That's great. Well, congratulations on your success. I can't wait to see what you have coming next. And Chloe, thank you so much for coming on. Oh yeah. Thank you for having me. It was a real pleasure. Chloe DeMont is the writer and director of Fair Play, available on Netflix right now, so go watch that if you haven't already. And this episode was produced by Jared Downing and Shana Roth, and we'll be back on Saturday for a regular Slate Money.